This program contains graphic images and discussion of medical procedures. Viewer discretion is advised. All right, so let's uh, go right into this. The role of uh, MRI in diagnosing osteomyelitis. I think it's fair to say uh, that this is a very uh, common test that we're using, most, probably the most common imaging modality that we use to, to diagnose osteomyelitis. And I'm going to go a step further to, to, to say that we're seeing now these tests being ordered, MRIs being ordered before x-rays are being ordered. And I'm sure that some of you are seeing that in your clinics and your hospital situations. I work in a couple of hospital systems, UCSF included. And both inpatient and in a clinic, we have patients coming in without x-rays, they're coming in with MRIs, and say, here. So what does that tell us? It's telling us that, for some reason, MRI is the go-to test. And how do we interpret that? And that's really the topic of today's talk. I have no disclosures. MRI, we know um, fairly, for, fairly certainly that um, sensitivity is very high specificity is fairly high as well. And when we look at the MRI, the most common in interpretation uh, that radiologists use is the bone marrow edema. So if you look at this T1 image here, uh, the bone should be lighter like this. And here you have a confluent geographic appearance that's low signal intensity, which is osteomyelitis. Same thing here on a T2 image where the bone should be black and you're seeing this whitish or high signal intensity. And this is what M osteo would look like in the MRI. The other things that we look for and we may request when we order MRI is IV gadolinium. And sometimes IV gadolinium can help us and sometimes it may not help us. But what does happen with gadolinium is that it doesn't really help us in PAD. So when we have patients with PAD, there's really no reason to order gadolinium. It does help us with um, differentiating soft tissue abscess, necro ne necrotic tissue, or sinus tract. So when you look at this picture here, coronal section of a metatarsal, uh, the gadolinium is right here, this enhancement, the white enhancement here. And in the middle, you're seeing the sinus tract. And when you see a sinus tract communicating directly to bone, along with bone marrow edema, that's typically consistent with osteomyelitis. So when you see those two signs, it pretty much tells you that osteomyelitis is present. Now let's go over a case real quickly. This is a case we had in UC within the last year. A 68-year-old male, 30, uh, history of diabetes for 30 years, comes in with, for another reason, to a medicine service, and uh, he's noticed to have and starts complaining of recurrent swelling, erythema, uh, cellulitis of the right forefoot around the first metatarsophalangeal joint. He's had several courses of oral antibiotics over the last two to three months, a course of two weeks, and what he reports that after he finishes the course, uh, he gets recurrent swelling. He did have a history of ulceration at the hallux interphalangeal joint, but no longer has that ulcer. Here are a few more pictures, and you can see that th this is a previous ulcer. It's completely healed, but yet there is a difference between the left and the right foot, slight swelling um, that's noticeable, along with some redness. We look at his labs, and we see the white blood cell count is normal, set rate is 4, CRP is 2.2, which are low and normal. He's afebrile. X-rays are taken, and the X-ray report, the X-ray reads, states that there's a cortical collapse, and it's concerning for osteomyelitis. So, of course, the recommendation by the radiology service is to order an MRI. So here we have an MRI. We have three different projections. Um, this is a T1 image, and what, what I want you to focus on is this dark, uh, low signal intensity of the first metatarsal head here. Uh, we have the same thing here and the same thing here on all three projections, and this uh, would be consistent with um, diagnosis of osteomyelitis. So what is the read? The read states uh, as follows. Osteomyelitis involving both sides of the first metatarsophalangeal joint, likely chronic, and most likely has septic arthritis as well. So the question is now that, that I would pose to you, well, what do we do as practitioners? What do we do with this read? How do we move forward? Because infectious disease service or hospitalist service or whoever has requested this consultation is asking you, go ahead and debride. There's osteomyelitis. Do the amputation. Or we need to do six to eight weeks of IV antibiotics and set up a PIC line, as Dr. Brickman was mentioning earlier. So how do we answer that question? <clears throat> 
So let's examine this real quickly. If we know that the sensitivity of the MRI is almost 100%, what that tells us is there's a very low to a non-existent false negative rate. So if you have a negative MRI, there's a very high negative predictive value. What that tells you is this osteomyelitis is not present. However, what happens if the MRI read is positive, right? If it's read as osteomyelitis. Well, the specificity is, let's say, up to 80%. That tells us that at bare minimum, there's a 20% false positive rate. So 20%, one out of five patients who are diagnosed by MR as osteomyelitis will not have osteomyelitis. Now, why does that happen? There are several reasons. One of the reasons is that many conditions can cause marrow edema, such as the one I showed you in the pictures. Inflammation of adjacent tissues may result in inflammation of the adjacent bone. What does that mean? That means that if you have cellulitis or you have a soft tissue abscess, without osteomyelitis, you can and frequently do have marrow edema of that adjacent bone. And that enhance, leads to osteomyelitis diagnosis on the MR. The other thing that we see is that the presence of Charcot makes it even more problematic and if not impossible to diagnose osteomyelitis. So these are some other things that will cause a false positive read a stress fracture, acute fracture, a recent surgery on the foot in that vicinity can cause false read. All, arthritis or altered weight bearing. Now, altered weight bearing is an interesting phenomenon. If you think about our diabetic patients, these are all patients that have peripheral neuropathy. They don't, they don't have the ability to sense what they're walking on and how much they're walking and the microtrauma that occurs. So that walking, the microtrauma that occurs is the altered weight bearing status and that's what can cause a marrow edema as well. A quick slide or, uh, or two on, um, on a Charcot. Here's a Charcot foot and this is normal. This is what normal bone should look like on a T1 weighted image. If you look at this tarsal metatarsal area, it has a low signal intensity. That's abnormal. And when you look at this view, this is a T2 image, the bone should be black, and yet the tarsal metatarsals are lit up or have a high signal intensity. And same thing here, this is abnormal. So this could be read as osteomyelitis, but yet this is arthropathy and has nothing to do with osteo. When you look at this picture here, we have a fracture of the navicular bone. There's no Charcot, this is just a fracture of a navicular bone. Look what happens in the MR. All of these tarsal bones are lit up, they're white, and they should be black. So this is a misdiagnosis of osteomyelitis, and this was just a simple fracture. Uh, Amadi did a study and published in radiology in 2006 when he looked at different things that radiologists look for to, de to determine whether it's osteomyelitis or not. And he, he wanted to see whether those particular findings would be present on infected cases such as osteo and non-infected cases such as Charcot. And he looked at subchondral cysts, joint erosions, marrow edema with or without gadolinium, and guess what? All of those things are both seen in infected cases and non-infected cases. He also looked at joint effusion, soft tissue collection, and both are seen in osteomyelitis and non-osteomyelitis MRs. The only one finding that was evident in infected cases versus non-infected cases was the sinus tract. So if you see a sinus tract, that actually leads you to believe the MRI is positive and is truly positive. So what can we surmise and what, how can we summarize the MRI? Well, we know that MRI is best imaging modality for diagnosing osteomyelitis. Hands down, there's no argument that MR is better than x-rays, it's better than CT scans, it's better than bone scans. And why is that? Because of the high sensitivity and a fairly high specificity. Positive predictive value of a positive MRI is 84% with one caveat, and this is a very, very important caveat. Pretest probability of 50%. Pretest probability is interchangeable with prevalence. So if we have a positive predictive value of 84%, which is what everybody lectures on, what radiologists tell us, what medicine colleagues believe, that is only with a pretest probability of 50%. Now let's examine the pretest probability for a second. The prob pretest probability is the probability of disease prior to testing. And that includes, in our osteomyelitis cases, and our hist number one is history. So if you have a patient with a long duration of an ulcer, lack of treatment progress, something like six months or so, if you have objective findings, extensive ulcer, a large ulcer, a deep probing ulcer that probes to bone, 
this increases your pretest probability of osteomyelitis. If you have diagnostic studies such as SED rate or CRP being elevated or positive erosion seen on the X-ray, this all increases your pretest probability of diagnosis of osteomyelitis. Okay. Now, here's a study. Here's a, this was a table that I borrowed from Kapoor's article published in 2007, Archives of Internal Medicine, and I want you to focus on, on, on something here. I mentioned to you that the pretest probability of 50% has a positive predictive value of 84%. But look what happens here. What if we have a pretest probability of 10%? Then the positive predictive value drops significantly to 36%, okay? Which, if that's the case, then why order an MRI to begin with? Some of the things that I mentioned already, the things that increase your pretest probability are large extensive ulcers, deep ulcers, ulceration over bony prominences, ulcers that fail to heal with standard treatment, biochemical markers such as set rate, CRP, and positive radiographic findings. Now to make it a little bit simpler, and I know I'm speaking fast because I'm trying to catch up a little bit, but I broke this down in three boxes, okay? And this is more for, for a clinician to, to take back home uh, for you next week when you're in clinic. Three boxes, low pretest probability, moderate pretest probability, and high pretest probability. The moderate pretest probability, let's say that's the pretest probability of 50%, okay? So what would that look like? That would be an ulcer that's been there for a long time, an ulcer that's deep, extensive ulceration, overlying bony prominence, recurrent infection, slow or stalled healing, and high set rate or CRP. Now, if we, have, if we move to the high pretest probability, then that's, a, that's an ulcer that probes to bone, possibly has radiographic signs of erosions consistent with osteomyelitis. So these two boxes are 50% and higher pretest probability. But what if we have an ulcer that's shallow, a full thickness ulcer, but that does not probe to bone, small in size, cellulitis without an ulceration. If we have lack of bony deformity and we have low set rate or normal set rate or low CRP and normal CRP and no signs of radiographic osteomyelitis, then that makes this a low pretest probability. So if we go back to our patient that I showed you with recurrent cellulitis with a positive read on the MR for osteomyelitis, how does this fare when we go through the boxes? Low set rate of four, CRP of 2.2, no ulceration, no probing to bone. So really, this is a low pretest probability. And if this is a low pretest probability, then the true positive predictive value of this MR is only 36%. So that begs the question, why order the MRI to begin with? And the answer is you really shouldn't order the MRI. But what happens in reality, in the real world, is MRI is being ordered at a drop of a dime, okay? So the key to, to this situation for us in the clinic is that we need to be able to go through this pretest probability in order to truly interpret the accuracy of this MR being positive for osteomyelitis. In this particular case, this is the x-ray of this patient. This patient had fracture of the, of the first metatarsal head, and because of that fracture, this was read falsely as positive for, for osteomyelitis. So in conclusion, what, what do we know about the MRI? If the MRI is negative, it does a good job of ruling out osteomyelitis. If the MRI is positive, it should be interpreted with extreme caution. Accuracy of MRI in distinguishing osteomyelitis versus Charcot has not been established in general population of diabetic patients with low prevalence of the disease. Interpretation of a positive MRI should be done in conjunction with other objective findings and never by itself. That's why it's critical that a clinician who treats the foot actually evaluates the MRI and not necessarily the radiologist because the radiologists don't have the luxury of seeing the patient ahead of time and knowing what we know when we perform our clinical exam. And as with, as with most other diagnostic tests, the predictive value is heavily influenced by the underlying prevalence of the disease. Thank you. Any questions? So Alex, thanks for an outstanding uh, summary of that.
uh, in uh, San Bernardino and Riverside County, if I had the money to pay for all that, I could have me a podiatry residency program because they ordered an MRI. So I had a sit an edict out to say that don't ever order an MRI before you consult me. So I've kind of cut them down significantly, but you definitely have great data then, so thank you. Hi, thank you. I enjoyed your uh, lecture. My main question is, how does the MRI change after, say, some type of amputation of the foot, partial amputation or debridement? How do we interpret it then? Is the positive predictive value of the test still moderate high? Because there'll probably be some healing from the bone. It's a great question. And the answer to that is that any surgery or amputation is going to cause an increase in bone marrow edema. So you're going to have the high signal in uptake in, um, uh, in T2 and low signal in T1. And basically, the answer to that question, it's unreliable. It absolutely is unreliable. And if we use the MRI to, to, make, to help us make the decision in cutting pieces of foot off or bone or whatever, we're going to be cutting off many, many pieces of bone without really needing to do it. And I think this is an incredibly important concept to understand because MRI is being ordered so much by everybody and not for mostly because people don't understand the pretest probability concept. Okay? And, and I think I urge you to, to really pay attention to that uh, and correlate it with uh, your clinical findings. Dave? Dr. Razelman, in, in regards to the uh, MRI and the, and the high pretest probability patients, why do it? Because you already know there's osteomyelitis after clinical impression and the other piece, unless you could use it to help you in your surgical planning. So my question is, do you think there's any value in the MRI in telling you the level of where the osteomyelitis is so we could get a clean margin or clean cultures in the metatarsals? Because in the midfoot, it always seems like it just goes everywhere. Right. Um, I will answer that question with telling you that, I don't know, I probably see 500 to 1,000 cases a year, and I probably order one or two MRIs per year. Um, I don't believe that MRI is good at surgical planning because of the high sensitivity that it has for more bone marrow uh, edema. So you can have osteomyelitis at the metatarsal head, and the entire midfoot will light up, and then you're stuck with that. Do I amputate to the midfoot level, or can I go in and just do a minor local debridement? So I think it's absolutely useless in that setting. However, a negative MRI tells you a lot. 